Hello, everyone. Eric Renya here, and welcome to the 110th episode of the Red Podcast. Manitoba's election is now just days away, and the polls that we saw at the midpoint suggested that this might be Wab Canoes and the NDP's election to lose. But can Heather Sevenson's PCs sometime, somehow pull it out before Tuesday? To set you up for the election on Tuesday, I'm joined by Curtis Brown, principal at the Winnipeg based polling for probe research, Ian Fraze, the CBC's provincial affairs reporter in Manitoba, and Kelly Saunders, associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Brandon University. Thank you all for joining me again. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, I want to go through each of the parties again, uh, and we'll start this time with the New Democrats, because it does seem that they are the front runners at this stage, at least with those polls that we saw in the midpoint. We haven't seen any over the last few days, so we don't really know for example, what impact the debate might have had on voting intentions. But if we assume, Ian, that the NDP is still in the driver's seat, what has been working for them in this campaign? They've, again, really capitalized on, on the health care. Um, it, it is a top issue for voters. They have stuck to it kind of single-mindedly. And the polling that, uh, I mean, Curtis can probably elaborate on a little bit later, is a testament to the fact that that it is working and that voters trust the NDP on health care overwhelmingly. Uh, it has seemed to work in their favor. Uh, Kelly, the same thing for you. What do you think has been the strong point of the NDP campaign, uh, assuming that, as I said, they are the front runners? And, uh, you know, there's also been uh, many debates. There's one televised debate, which is probably the one most Manitobans would have seen. Uh, how do you think he's done in that? So just in general, what, what is your assessment so far of mm -hmm. NDP and Wap Canoe? Right. Yes. Um, I think Ian's right. I, I think the, the issues have really lined up in a way that really support uh, the, the NDP. It's, it's been primarily about health care. They've stuck consistently to that message. And, and I think that that is a message that is clearly resonating with voters. So that they, they've certainly won on that point. But I also think Wab Canoe's done quite well in, in the debates. He's been um, energized. He's been engaging. He's been charismatic. Um, demonstrating a good command of the issues and the files and seems to be quite confident and, and almost relaxed uh, on the stage compared to certainly Heather Stephenson, which we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. It does seem like uh, we don't know what numbers the PCs have, but they, they don't seem like they must be that different from the public ones. Uh, Curtis, you know, you've been assessing the state of public opinion. You've looked at various issues and how the parties uh, stack up on them. So are there vulnerabilities for the NDP, maybe based in their electoral coalition or on some issues that maybe could become problematic for them between now and Election Day? At this point, I, I don't know. I mean, it would really take something, I think, to really knock them off course. I mean, I, I agree to some extent with Kelly and Ian about, um, you know, how they've lined up on, on the issues. I mean, we had some polling that uh, we asked people about which party would be best suited to address um, the issues. And normally some of the ones that would be stronger for the Conservatives and weaker for the NDP, like managing the economy or crime, you know, dealing with crime and some of those sorts of things, um, the NDP either had actually a bit of an advantage or, you know, was pretty close to the Conservatives. And so uh, I think, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think, uh, you know, sort of the issues that they've talked about and focused on and where they're seen as being stronger are kind of more aligned with the public's issues and priorities, uh, maybe compared to the Conservatives. Um, and also, yeah, and I, I think I do agree with Kelly. I mean, I think uh, Wab Canoe's also been pretty poised. He's been pretty relaxed. He's a strong communicator. Um, even when the party leaders tried to go after him a little bit more in the in the debates, he was fairly unflappable. He hasn't had any kind of other gaps or unforced errors. Um, yeah, and I also don't think that, you know, debate moderators or the media in general have really kind of, you know, laid a hard glove on him. Um, so he hasn't really made any kind of mistake or, or anything like that uh, in terms of something that would trip him up or maybe cause some kind of controversy or scandal or something where he's more on defense as opposed to on offense. If you, uh, Curtis, were looking at the, the numbers from your poll in the middle point of the campaign, would there be anything there, though, that would make the NDP a bit worried? No, not really. I mean, I think the biggest the biggest weakness in terms of issues for the NDP is just how they're perceived on the economy. I mean, that's something where um, our poll found that the concert, you know, the, the conservatives uh, were seen as being uh, better suited to um, bringing jobs to Manitoba, growing the economy in Manitoba. You know, but, uh, you know, but in some of the other things, uh, you know, we would, I would have thought maybe, you know, maybe crime would be a bit of an issue. I mean, the conservatives have really tried to say that, yeah, under the NDP, violent crime is going to be worse. But um, I think 
that's also been a bit of a difficult message for them in what's traditionally a stronger conservative, you know, like something where they normally have a bit of an advantage over parties like the NDP. Wab Canoe came out in August and kind of addressed that because especially in his case, you know, some of the things, you know, from his own past and, you know, having, uh, you know, been, been charged with things in the past, um, that might have been a bit of an issue. But it has, I think he dealt with that, sort of got it out of the way pretty quickly and then kind of moved on to other things. And the conservatives, you know, I think tried to link that back to the NDP and say that it would be worse. But I mean, they haven't really been able to do that successfully. And I think part of it is also just because, yeah, under, you know, while they've been in government, um, crime, you know, crime and, and the perceived threat of crime has gotten worse uh, in Winnipeg and in Manitoba. Ian, uh, so if the New Democrats have been really hitting the message hard on health care, is, is there something that they're, the way that they're approaching the issue that is working? Because just, you know, saying you're the party of health care, the NDP, uh, you know, would traditionally be uh, have an advantage on that issue. But are they taking an approach on it that is resonating in particular? Is, is, what's their strategy when it comes to the health care issue? I guess b- before the uh, campaign officially got underway in September, they, they made a fairly big promise in August that they would reverse some of the consolidation plan or the consolidation that the Tories did early in their mandate, which involved closing three ERs. The NDP, which had... Uh, one point said that it wasn't practical financially has reversed that and now says, you know, they're going to reopen those three yards. The first being in South Winnipeg where they need to win a couple of seats. Uh, That's, that's also been an easy subject for people to grasp and understand Um, that, you know, we're going to reopen three ERs. People didn't like their ERs being closed. They're going to reopen them. So that, that's been sort of a through line for the NDP throughout healthcare. And then basically each day since they have talked about a different issue in healthcare. You know, they had the, the home care announcement one day, uh, senior announcements the next day. They've talked about each individual hospital. It hasn't necessarily been super flashy. You know, it's not as flashy as getting rid of, uh, you know, the payroll taxes the PCs have said, but it's, it's given them an authority a little bit on, on that issue that they're talking about it from every angle. And all, we all know, I think, the biggest challenge the NDP will have is staffing. There are shortages throughout the country, but Wab Canoe has been has acknowledged that at each point at at each instance he's always said that staffing is going to be the big issue uh whether or not voters believe he can actually do it i guess is is up for the debate but it does seem like there is an appetite for from voters to give the ndp a chance we actually just saw i think on wednesday a number of high profile doctors coming out and endorsing the ndp's plan and that may have some weight what I've noticed, uh, just as I'm going through some of the ridings, looking at the the uh, websites for each of the parties, whenever there's an NDP candidate who is even tangentially related to the healthcare uh, system and industry, it talks about how this person is, uh, you know, was once a paramedic and like, you know, the New Democrats will uh, fix the healthcare and all this. So it's clear that they've made it this issue for them. Um, Kelly, does this issue... Is, does it resonate outside of Winnipeg? Because we've seen in, in polls, both by Probe and the Angus Reid Institute, that the NDP seems to be doing, they're still trailing outside of Winnipeg, but the margins are a lot closer than they were in the last election. So is this issue resonating outside of the city? And, and do they have some real prospects of picking up some seats in southern Manitoba outside of the capital? Uh, Yes, absolutely. It resonates outside of Winnipeg. And in fact, it's more acute for us Uh, when you have, you know, small towns that uh, that have their emergency rooms shut down on an ongoing uh, regular basis, as we're seeing all throughout western Manitoba and indeed uh, everywhere outside of uh, the city of Winnipeg. uh, That becomes, you know, incredibly um, uh, even a more pressing issue than it is in Winnipeg because people are having to drive for hours in some cases in order to access emergency services. So, so we feel those issues very, very closely out here. And, and no question, I think, that that is really helping the NDP um, pick up some, or return to some seats that they might have had before, long-standing seats like, for example, in Brandon East or in places like Dauphin that they lost to the Conservatives in 2016. So I think you're going to see some flipping happening of some of those seats, and, and it really does come down to a lot of their promises are around the health care file. Uh, let's uh, move on to uh, the PCs. Um, Ian, what's been their approach over the last little while? Because it does seem uh, that they've, they've, they have taken a bit of a, an attack route in terms of, of their advertising. 
Yeah, I mean, what I've been struck with is is since Heather Stephens came into office two years ago, and really in the last year, the the kind of centrist turn they've taken of, you know, increases in funding everywhere, really putting an end to the years of austerities, you know, going to, you know, Heather Stephenson walking in pride, money for gender affirming care, really a, a centrist play to get out Winnipeg. Yet, as we've seen in the last week, um, they've really gone to issues that are somewhat divisive and might lean a little more right. They are actively campaigning on their opposition to a search of the landfill for two First Nations women, which is turning some people off, quite a, quite a few people off, frankly, the, the wrong way. Um, we have pro polling that says that the Manitobans are fairly split on the issue. Uh, but, but even still, I guess the Tories feel they have some kind of internal, some kind of numbers that suggest that they can at, uh, really uh, push this. You know, they've talked about parental rights, which would have sh- you know, which I think would have surprised many people months ago that they're even going down this road considering their attempts to go centrist. But they have a feeling that, you know, that can win them some, some votes. They've, you know, just on Wednesday in the Winnipeg Free Press, a full page ad sort of making, you know, personal attacks at, at certain NDP candidates. Uh, I guess in this last week of that campaign for the, the PCs, it might be a feeling of, well, let's see if this sticks. Let's try something else. Because so far, their attempts, you know, in the first two weeks to talk affordability, you know, maybe it didn't resonate to the degree that they wanted. And, and they are trying something else. It is, though, also turning people off as well. Curtis, what's your view on what's driving this strategy from the PCs? And, you know, uh, Ian mentioned the poll that you had conducted. Uh, I, one of the extra questions I would have on it is, is that going to be a voting issue for the kind of swing voters that both of these parties are, are chasing after? Yeah, I, I honestly, I, I don't totally know what to, it's, it's a little baffling um, to sort of see that. I, I sort of see this as being in some ways, you know, campaigning on that issue. Um, and just kind of the overall Tory tone at this point is very much sort of sauve la mob, like save the furniture and see what you can um, salvage in terms of uh, in terms of seats. Based on uh, you know, in many ways, I feel like it's aimed at um, you know. I mean, in our poll about the about searching the landfill, I mean, the, it was it tended to be people. You know, it was it was older um, people. You know, less education. Um, you know, maybe sort of you know more you know more low information voters who. Uh, you know, might be more opposed to that. And it seems like it's really about trying to activate those folks. I mean, because, yeah, as Ian said, there is a there is a bit of a split um, and maybe about kind of trying to galvanize, um, you know, people who are maybe kind of, um, you know, in that in some of those demographic categories to be able to, you know, get out. And maybe that's something that is going to motivate them. I don't know. But yeah, it's incredibly divisive. And I think it is, you know, I think for, you know, some folks, including, yeah, including conservative voters, I think it's kind of, you know, kind of off putting. And um, uh, yeah, it just seems like it's, you know, they, like Ian said, um, they sort of tried to do this affordability uh, approach and early in the campaign. I mean, it is a big issue. I mean, our polling, you know, shows that it was kind of like the number four issue was, you know, affordability, but they really focused on it in the, through the prism of tax cuts instead of other things. And I don't know that that totally resonated. And uh, yeah, so instead at this point, it seems like it's just been a really kind of aggressive, um, uh, you know, way of trying to, you know, shift things and have a bit of a wedge between um, the PCs and the, and the NDP uh, and trying to activate people who maybe are going to be motivated by that or think that it's not a good idea. But um, yeah, it's, uh, and, and I think just more broadly, I mean, there's also just, I think over the two or so years that the conservatives have been in power. There's been this real like, or sorry, that Heather Stephenson has been premier, I should say. There's been this real kind of like, I don't know, different kind of approaches or faces uh, of the government. I mean, when she came in, it was very much about like reconciliation and working together after Brian Pallister. And then it became about spending a lot of money. And then as that was happening, they started to go up in our polling and kind of basically come back. And then now it's kind of they've taken this, I don't know how to call it exactly, hard right or, you know, hard edge turn again. And I just, I, I sort of wonder if the public's just kind of like, well, well, who are you? Who are they? What's going on? So, yeah, strange. I, I for my perspective, I, I, it sounds like concern that their own base isn't going to come out because I had also seen there was an ad from the PCs about how lockdowns were a thing of the past, uh, which, you know, that hasn't been an issue for a while. So anybody who really cares about that 
uh, it seems like the kind of person that the PCs would have normally had in the bag. So to go after issues like this sounds to me like they have much more concern about getting their own people out to vote than trying to convince any swing voters. So saving the furniture you know, sounds like a little bit of a, an accurate uh, description of the strategy at this stage. Um, Kelly, what is your, what is your take on, on this approach on the landfill search and, and how this has become an issue? And also on the parent, parental rights, I'm interested in that because in New Brunswick, uh, there's been word that you know, Blaine Higgs, uh, who, whose policy kind of started this at, the, at least at the political stage, that he is watching the results in Manitoba to see if it is a pointing towards this being a vote winner because in New Brunswick they're considering going to an election and this would be one of the issues that the PCs would, would use in that campaign. So I'm curious what your view is on, on this approach that the PCs have taken in Manitoba. It is odd um, because, number one, it undermines so much of the credibility and, and the tactics that the party has been trying to uh, to do since Heather Stephenson became Premier, as, as my colleagues here have mentioned. She really tried to demonstrate that she's not Brian Pallister, that she's more conciliatory. She's going to reach out across the aisle and be more of an empathetic kind of leader. And these latest tactics really undermine all of that work that she's been trying to do on that front in two years. And I think also, too, uh, you know, there's a, there's a high 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 risk in this uh, in this tactic that they're engaging in because that is typically not how we do things in Manitoba our political culture is moderate it's centrist we don't give uh, we're not uh, easily swayed by extremism and in fact you know as uh, as my colleagues know right our most successful premiers over the years have been people like Gary Dewar for example Duff Roblin we go back to in the 1960s to show you know that that kind of moderate centrism um, uh, and and really focusing on the progressive side of the conservative equation in the party. This has really kind of undermined all of that. So I, I think that there is, as I said, big risk for the party. The parental rights issue, we're seeing big pushback from community members, from groups across the province, uh, from citizens who might not have been motivated around other issues, but are saying, this just doesn't feel right. This isn't really who we are as Manitobans. So I, I think that the party's really going to struggle after the election if they don't form government, um, because this is really going to come back to haunt them in terms of where do they go from here. Uh, Curtis, uh, we've seen it before where PCs beat their polls, uh, outperform it. Do you, do, is, are the ingredients there for this, in this case, uh, based on you know support among age or anything like that? Like, Could we see a, a closer result than the polls are suggesting just because traditionally that's you know, the Tories tend to beat their polls. Yeah, it's possible. Um, I mean, we, you know, like, I mean, in our poll, we, we don't model by likely turnout or anything like that. And yeah, I mean, older voters, we do know are definitely more likely to lean conservative. So, I mean, there is, yeah, there is a possibility that they could. Um, and, but I mean, also part of it, I think also speaks to some of these things about, um, yeah, who gets out to vote and, uh, and who's kind of more motivated. And if some of these things are about that, I mean, there is a possibility that that could happen, but, but at the same time, I mean, I think, you know, in this case, I mean, for every, for every person who's kind of motivated to, to, to go, you know, more likely to go vote because of that, there could be two or three more that um, go, well, I'm, I'm not voting conservative now because, yeah, this is not the progressive conservative kind of message or way and I'm, I'm just going to stay home or I'm going to vote for someone else. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have any, yeah, I don't have any other sort of polling insight, you know, besides what we've, uh, you know, come up with uh, about a week ago, but um but yeah, I think it's uh, it's po it, it, it's possible it could be there. There's you know some of the seeds of it, but at the same time, I think it's also just as likely that you know things could go the other way as well, and you know the the, the Tories can end up even underperforming a little bit. Yeah, you never assume that you know the errors in the polls from a previous election are going to go in the same direction in the in the next one. That's a, a good way to make two mistakes rather than one. Um, uh, Ian. Um, Let's move on to the Liberals. So, you know, they're, uh, they started the campaign talking about potential of holding the balance of power. And how's their campaign been going since, since the outset when things were maybe looking a little better for them than they have in the last stage? Yeah. Um, the, the chance of them being that balance of power decreases if their seat count drops, right? And they have three now. You know, Dougal Lamont says he they have the potential to win more, but, you know, they are facing tough challenges in St. Boniface. The NDP is very much on the attack, and, and we're seeing them holding multiple announcements in St. Boniface. They've made a play. The NDP made a play for River Heights, uh, promising a new gym for, for Calvin High School. 
So again, if those factors, you know, if the NDP is able to steal some of that, it really decreases the, the chance of, of the Liberals being a player. Uh, Wab Canoe has made direct appeals multiple times, including in the televised debate for Liberals to go in their direction. Polling has traditionally put the Liberals in kind of that double digit, maybe low double digit mark. But, you know, I think in 9%, I believe, is what they got in both the Angus Reid and, and the pro poll. That does suggest liberal support has cratered. They don't have a candidate in around nine ridings. You know, considering the liberals can be more left-leaning, if they can steal some of those, ND, or if the NDP can get some of those votes, it does give the NDP sort of more pass uh, to victory. Uh, we also saw Dougal Lamont being... A little, a little feisty, I, I could say, last week. He responded to the polls of saying, you know, if we just relied on polls, what's the point of elections? What's the point of campaigns? Like, he's really fired back at it. He called Wab Canoe a liar for saying he had the endorsement of Doug Ailson, a former liberal MP. So I, I think you can even just see in Lamont's public comments sort of the, the anger, the, the, the feistiness that he's shown that, that they know that um, things could be a little dicey for them come election day. Kelly, what stood out uh, for you uh, from the Liberal campaign? Yeah, absolutely. I think they've really been squeezed out. I think that uh, they began with a good message that, look, there is a third option. You don't have to, you know, vote PC or NDP. You can't, you can vote us. There's another, there's another way uh, forward. Uh, but, but that message has really been squeezed out is, is the two parties, the two campaigns uh, have really polarized themselves or, or become more polarized. Um, obviously, you know, the, the Tories, as we've been talking about, really on the attack and really trying to frame this narrative of, you know, the NDP are scary, they're criminals, we can't take a chance on them, they're inexperienced. And then the NDP really trying to frame around a more aspirational message, but really trying to stick to issues of health care and, and again, uh, reaching out specifically to Liberal voters that if you really don't want to see another PC government, we are the only option. And so there's really been no place for the Liberals to go. And Ian's absolutely right. When you look at the three seats that they have in Winnipeg, they are in trouble in those three seats, never mind growing their seat count. So, and you can see it in the ways in which Dougal Lamont has changed, um, even just at the debate that I mentioned uh, in, in Brandon that we had a couple of days ago. He came across as much more angry, more irascible, uh, more frustrated uh, in, in compared to previous uh, debates that I've seen him in. So I think the, the, f the facts, uh, what's happening on the ground, the realities that they're facing, uh, are really becoming more and more clear to them. Curtis, how much of a role does the Liberal vote and the amount of the vote that they get, how much of a role does that play in the NDP's chances of winning a majority or a minority government? It's huge. Um, Kelly talked about the success of Gary Dewar as being one of our most successful premiers and certainly probably, you know, successfully electorally for the NDP. Uh, one of the things he used to always say was hug a Liberal. And uh, that's, I think the NDP has definitely taken that um, advice uh, in spades. Um, they're not just doing it implicitly, they're doing it very explicitly. And I think that, you know, the NDP has always done well when they've been able to uh, absorb a lot of liberal vote into, uh, into their party. Uh, and the liberals are down at in the single digit range, that always bodes well for the NDP. Conversely, the conservatives always need the liberals to be a little bit stronger. Um, they seem to do better when the liberals are in the high teens. I mean, that usually means that uh, the Tories are able to win uh, seats in um, uh, south, you know, certainly suburban Winnipeg with uh, with a plurality of the vote because some of that liberal vote is peeling away the uh, uh, peeling away the NDP support. So. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, our polling, yeah, as, as Ian said, we had them at 9%. Uh, I think they've, uh, yeah, they've, you know, they've come out and, uh, you know, I think struggled to gain traction. It's going to be difficult uh, for them to, uh, you know, get more seats. And the NDP has really been eating their lunch in a lot of ways. I mean, making very specific targeted announcements in seats like River Heights or going out to Lorette, for example, which is in Dawson Trail and promising to build a new community center out there. That's a seat where there's no liberal candidate. And the liberals actually did fairly, you know, we're second, but a distant second, but still second last time. And I think they're trying to get as much of that vote to consolidate that because that's a seat, a rural seat the NDP could potentially uh, pick up. And yeah, I think that, um, the, you know, the liberals, you know, this often happens in election, but I think especially so in this one, they're, they're frustrated. And I mean, Dougal Lamont, uh, I think when our poll came out, said that, uh, yeah, that polls are essentially designed to manipulate people and, uh, you know, that they really have no value. And 
I don't know. I mean, people say, uh, you know, people say not great things sometimes when they're worried about losing their job. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's just kind of, I think, par for the course in terms of uh, how it's gone for the Liberals and how it's going right now. Uh, beyond uh, who will actually win, and I'll, I'll give you all a chance to, to think about it. Um, what's the big question that you think will be answered by the results on Tuesday? Uh, for me, like the question I'm, I still have is whether the NDP is going to be able to pull this off because of, um, you know, we've seen them do well in the polls, but the Tories have just been very difficult to, to defeat in past elections, but we've seen them elsewhere in other provinces that uh, right now there is a, a wave of conservative governments across the country. Uh, Pierre Poilev and the conservatives are doing quite well in places like Manitoba. So I'm curious to see if we're talking on Wednesday about a bit of a surprise that the PC vote has turned out and that these issues that people might be squeamish and uncomfortable talking about publicly are actually driving some of this vote. And, you know, I think, like I mentioned before, for Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick, who's considering running a campaign on parental rights, is this one of those issues that is silently galvanizing people that brings him out to the polls? So I am curious to see um, what will happen because of that. So for the, the, the three of you, uh, Kelly, we'll start with you. What would be the question that you're most curious to see answered on Tuesday night? Yeah, there's actually two, if I can put put forward two. Um, I fully agree. I, I want to see if this uh, shift to the right in dog whistle politics um, or maybe federal conservative party style, whether or not that's going to play out in Manitoba, whether or not we, we have changed or political culture has shifted, we are more like other, other conservative provinces, or if we are still more moderate, uh, liking our, our conservative parties to be a little bit more progressive at the provincial level. That's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, to embrace uh, our first First Nations Premier, I think if we are, that means that we are ready to advance on, on questions and issues and conversations around reconciliation, uh, that the kind of dirty tactics we see in attempts to maybe, again, dog whistle politics around issues of race and racism in this province, that that's, that's not going to play here. So I think that that is going to be quite a momentous uh, event uh, one way or the other if we choose to go with, uh, with our first position. Curtis, uh, why don't you go next? Yeah, I would I would echo what Kelly's question about yeah whether we are ready for our first First Nations Premier and how people feel about that. Uh, I think our you know our polling has shown that um, people generally you know do feel that yeah they they, they like Wab Canoe. Um, their opinion of them has grown um, certainly among the you know certainly among the voters that uh, that the NDP needs to win and you know he's seen as being uh, competent, uh, competent and will be a, you know potentially a good premier. And I but I think also I mean one of the other related questions of that is, you know, also are Manitobans ready to give the keys back to the NDP? Um, it has been eight years. I mean, when they got voted out, they Manitoba turned pretty hard uh, on the NDP after a long period in power, and it was a pretty tumultuous point at the end. Not everything was great. Not everything went smoothly. And so I guess I, I do wonder if that's also something that Manitobans are prepared to do. And it's, it's interesting because, I mean, the Conservatives, I think, in the in the dying days of this campaign have, you know, as Ian mentioned with that ad, you know, sort of talked about like, you know, do we want to turn, you know, do we want to turn things over to the NDP? Don't gamble on the NDP and talking about all these, you know, different people in the in the team. And I guess I do kind of wonder and I'm not sure I haven't really seen evidence that, you know, Manitobans have thought about this a great deal, but uh, it is something that could come up is um, how do Manitobans feel about, yeah, like not only is this going to be an NDP government, but it's going to be a brand new group of people, um, you know, without a lot of experience, uh, different backgrounds. And, and how do they, yeah, how, how do they feel about, uh, you know, their ability and uh, to, to, to govern effectively? I mean, that has been one of the conservative arguments, and I'm not sure that they made it enough or as well as they could have. Uh, and they kind of made it in a pretty ham-handed way. But, um, but I do think that that is, you know, if you were to go back, I mean, that is one of the questions that um, the Conservatives probably, you know, could have asked more throughout this campaign is, is, you know, are we ready to go back to the NDP? Do you want this particular inexperienced group to be to be running things? And so that's one of the things that I'm curious about and wondering about uh, going into the election. Ian, uh, beyond uh, how late you'll have to stay up covering this uh, for the CBC, what, what's the question you'll uh, look to see answered on Tuesday night? I think you've all got great questions, and I'm curious for the answers for all of them. Maybe for me, just to go even a little more in depth on, on the parental rights and you know the landfill search. Well, actually, maybe more parental rights. 
I do see it as a play for some of the some of the newcomers to the country that can be a little more conservative. Uh, you know, Fort Richmond in South Winnipeg, Waverly, McPhillips up north, those uh, constituencies have, uh, you know, a fairly significant newcomer population. I do see parental rights is playing with some of those audiences more. And so it's maybe, maybe a little more in depth, but again, looking at some of those ridings, particularly if the Tories are able to hold on, it does show that, Hey, maybe this parental rights thing worked at least in a few ridings. Cause you know, we were talking two weeks ago that, you know, this could come down to just a few seats that might've changed a little bit, but there is a chance it could hold on to some of those seats. I would credit that with parental rights. Heather Stephenson will, he, she'll get challenged at every debate about it and she'll get challenged by the media, but on the ground, when you're telling parents, you know, Hey, you're going to have a, we just want you to have more of a say in your child's education. Um, that I do believe, and I think, and they do have the records or the internals that show that, that it does play with some newcomer communities. So it'd be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting result. First change of government that we've had since, if there is one, uh, since uh, the Nova Scotia election in, in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it's been a few years and uh, it could, if it ends up being a blowout, then, you know, my, maybe Ian, you'll be done going home pretty early. But if it, if it does end up coming down to a handful of seats, it could be a really, really tight outcome. And the, the Liberals could still hold that balance of power. So, um, you know, some of the polls uh, suggested it might be an early night, but uh, there's still lots of potential for it to be a really fascinating result. If I may, this is also Manitoba's first uh, experience with electronic voting machines. So that could oh, no. also make it happen a little faster, too, as opposed to having to wait for or, it to watch all the paper. Or very slow, depending on like Alberta, I think. Out. Yeah, ah, good point. Or New Brunswick. Good point. And uh, oh boy, that always makes me nervous. Okay, well, then uh, we'll have lots to watch on a Tuesday night. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining me. And uh, have a good election. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much.